Welcome. Students and youth workers and youth pastors, welcome to our Yale Youth Ministry Institute luncheon lecture. My name is Skip Masbach. I am the director of the Yale Youth Ministry Institute and the associate director of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. And we are delighted you're here and have come inside on a day that is almost impossible to resist being outside given the weather we've had. So thank you for joining us today. I have just a couple of announcements before we introduce the really extraordinary guests that have agreed to join us today. And the first relates to the Ministry Resource Center. All of these books and materials and training videos, et cetera, that you see around are in a section of our Yale Divinity School Library called the Ministry Resource Center. And the director, Carolyn Engelhardt, is right here. Kind of stand up so everybody can see you. This. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I graduated here in 1994 and went into ministry and ran into the problem, oh my goodness, what am I going to do on Sunday night? This was an amazing place to go because they have deeply theological but also eminently usable, user-friendly games, videos, teaching resources, curricular materials, wonderful resources. And Carolyn would love to give you a tour of the Ministry Resource Center right after this lecture, so please look for Carolyn and take a look at the resources. Second, I want to be sure that I flack for you the amazing lecture we were going to be have for our last monthly luncheon lecture of the year, which is going to be on May 2nd. Dr. Almeida M. Wright, a professor of religious education here at Yale Divinity School, and Mr. Niall Fort, a minister and scholar in Newark, New Jersey, will be here to talk about agency, and you can see more about that lecture on these flyers on your desks. How agency, how empowering young people to take responsibility and understand that they are not just human beings in preparation, not just somebody who can love and be loved later, but how learning to love and be loved and seek justice now is part of laying foundations for a flourishing and joyful life. That's this May 2nd. And finally, because I do this every month, but you won't have to listen to this much more because June is almost here, you will see on your tables these flyers about our fifth annual Yale Youth Ministry Institute Summer Symposium, the week of June 4 to June 8, every night of the week from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock, dinner, worship, and then amazing lectures. And the lecture themes of the monthly lectures are what are the practices, orientations, attitudes, and beliefs that would be foundations of flourishing and joyful lives if we could share them with our young people while they were in our care in our churches? Today's, for instance, is how imagination and creativity is an orientation, belief, attitude that is foundational for life with God and a life of joy. In the summer, what we address is what's killing our kids? Because the suffering of modern day adolescence, which is profoundly broad and well known by each of you, does not mean there is not access to joy or importance for joy. In fact, every one of the scholars that we've welcomed has made the point, suffering in the midst of adversity, in the midst of adversity there can be joy. Joy after adversity, joy anticipating adversity, joy of communion with God and neighbor in the midst of adversity can be a resource, a power, a form of resistance against whatever that affliction is. So what we do in the summer symposium for all three years is we pick up five of the sources of adversity that many adolescents are coping with and we welcome leading scholars in the country in to share with us how you administer with and walk with young people who are facing these afflictions and minister with a promise and hope of joy. So this summer you can see in this brochure, Dr. Alan Cole is the head of the social work school at the University of Texas, and he will be speaking on anxiety. On June 5th, one of the nation's really extraordinary scholars, the Reverend Dr. Elizabeth Conde Frazier and Reverend Ruben Ortiz will be talking on poverty. June 6th, 
Jamie Smith and Dr. Carl David Bennett on idolatry. On June 7th, Dr. Lisa Miller is the head of clinical psychology at Columbia University and Teachers College, will be speaking on spirituality. And she has extraordinarily imaginative research where her clinical studies have developed evidence that the practice of personal prayer and meditation changes in visible ways the structure of the brain that is protective and buffers against depression. And that they have tracked young people and found that prayerful meditative practices provide more protection against adolescent onset and then developmental recurring uh, episodes of depression more effectively than medications. So spirituality and, uh, and how it changes our resilience in the world on the 7th. And then on the 8th, our own Dr. Joyce Mercer uh, will be with us with Dr. Uh, Reverend Charles Atkins on substance abuse. This isn't how do we stop the culture from bringing and tempting our young people with substances, it's how do you walk with them in the midst of substance abuse to create the possibility of joy and resilience and resistance. So, you'll have on your, you have on your tables an expression of interest form. This isn't a commitment, you don't have to sign up, you don't have to come if you sign this, but if you'll just have any interest at all and give us one of these forms with your email on it, we'll be able to communicate with you as we do the run up to June to let you know uh, the more materials and details about the course. All right, let's say a word of prayer and blessing over our food. God of life and love, made known to us in and through Jesus the Christ, we thank you for this opportunity to gather. We thank you for this opportunity to break bread and conversation with other folks who have experienced a call and responded to care for our youth. We thank you for our guest speakers today who bring us their lives of commitment and scholarship and reflection that we might be better equipped for our ministry with our young. We thank you for this food and ask your blessing on the food and on the hands that prepared for it, prepared it even as you bless to us care and concern for those who today have too little or none. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'd like to introduce my partner at the Yale Youth Ministry Institute uh, and Associate Research Scholar at the Yale Center for Faith and Culture, Dr. Sarah Farmer. Good afternoon. And so I'm really excited to introduce our guest for today. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Stephanie Pauzel who is currently the Hewitt Professor of the Practice of Ministry Studies at Harvard Divinity School. During her time at Harvard, she has also served in the roles of Associate Dean for Faculty and Curricular Affairs and Associate Dean for Ministry Studies. Before coming to Harvard, she served as Director of Ministry Studies and Senior Lecturer in Religion and Literature at the University of Chicago Divinity School. An ordained minister in the Disciples of Christ Church, Dr. Paul Zell studies the points of intersection between intellectual work and spiritual practice, between the academic study of religion and the practices of ministry, and between the contemplative and active dimensions of the vocation of minister and teacher. She is also the author of Honoring the Body, Meditations on a Christian Practice, which recently just got picked up and will be reprinted, as well as co-editor of The Scope of Our Art, The Vocation of the Theological Teacher. And her current research is on Virginia Woolf and religion. With her is Miss Vanessa Zoltan. You may have never seen Miss Zoltan in person, but you may have heard her on the internationally acclaimed podcast, Harry Potter in the Sacred Text, where she serves as the co-host. It is one of the most popular podcasts in the country, which attracts a large amount of millennials to discuss spiritual matters around the book, Harry Potter. Ms. Zoltan's work with Jane Eyre and Harry Potter has been written about in the New York Times and covered on CNN. Vanessa also blogs for the Huffington Post and has written for America and Tablet Magazines and she is currently working on a book about treating Harry Potter as sacred text. 
Vanessa Zoltan is also a research assistant and instructor at Harvard Divinity School. Would you please join me in welcoming our guest today? Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go first, but I know many of you came to hear Vanessa Zoltan of Harry Potter and the Sacred Text. Um, Vanessa and I are so grateful to Sarah and to Skip um, for their great kindness and for inviting us to be a part of this important work. Um, we've learned from them um, that you all have been doing this work together for quite a while now. And while Vanessa and I are eager to share with you what we've been thinking about and learning about joy and creativity and imagination, um, we're really eager to hear from you about what you've been learning, and we look forward very much to the conversation today. Our plan is that I'll talk for 25 to 30 minutes, and um, then Vanessa will lead us in a practice uh, to give you a taste of what we're talking about. So um, we're really glad to be here. It's an interesting time to be talking about adolescence and joy because adolescents have been leading the way in expressing a deep dissatisfaction with what is going on in this country. They took their lament to the streets after Trayvon Martin's killer was set free. They lay down on highways and church steps and the sidewalks of their cities with masks on their faces that said, I can't breathe after Eric Garner was killed. They marched for weeks in Ferguson, Missouri after the shooting of Michael Brown and started a movement for black lives that continues to challenge our status quo. Most recently, we've seen survivors of a high school massacre in Florida and young people who have grown up in neighborhoods plagued by gun violence stand together to say that it is not acceptable that our country care more about easy access to guns than we do about the slaughter of our children. If you heard Parkland High School senior Emma Gonzalez give her powerful speech in the two days after the shooting, then you know what it sounds like when someone has had it. All of these kids, from Ferguson to Florida to Chicago, have had it with the violence directed at them and with adult complacency in the face of it. Now, as we all know, there are powerful forces that have a vested interest in silencing these young, deeply dissatisfied voices. And one of the ways they do it is to encourage the shaming of these young people if they show any capacity for joy. Why all the laughter, some ask, when they see the Parkland kids cracking jokes on social media. I thought you were mourning your friends. How offensive, some said, when Beyonce released her video, Formation, with its image of a young boy dancing joyfully before a line of police officers in riot gear in front of graffiti that said, stop shooting us. Our culture often only seems comfortable with young people's expressions of dissatisfaction with the way things are if they do it off camera, in silence, and in tears when they post smiling photos of themselves with their arms wrapped around each other, or videos of themselves singing along to the Hamilton soundtrack as they travel to Tallahassee to lobby their legislators. Well, that's a different thing. Why all the joy if they're supposed to be so sad? Now, you're all here because you want the young people with whom you minister to know joy. But I think it's worth asking if our institutions, including our churches, really do want adolescents to experience joy. Because joy will not create compliant young people. Joy is excessive. It spills over from one part of life to another. It makes us feel that we can do more 
and be more than we once thought we could do and be. If you've ever seen young people dancing with utter abandon, or if you remember dancing that way yourselves, well, that's what we mean by joy. Joy opens us up. Joy reaches us in the deepest parts of ourselves. Joy is a potentially transformative force. It has the power to change us. Joy, however, is not synonymous with happiness. And certainly, it is not the same thing as satisfaction. In the Bible, and I'm thinking particularly of the Psalms, joy seems often to be connected with dissatisfaction. The word joy often follows the words, and yet, or but. In the Psalms, true joy emerges from experiences of dissatisfaction. Psalm 13 opens with, how long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? And it ends with, but my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. In Psalm 30, we hear that weeping may come for the night, but joy comes with the morning. My enemies are plotting against me, Psalm 71 says, but I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. That kind of radical hope seems to be a crucial part of joy for the psalmist. It makes of joy, as Professor Willie Jennings says in one of the videos for this project, an act of resistance against the forces of despair. It is an act of resistance and an act of resilience. The psalmist whose pain and sorrow do not keep him from making a joyful noise. And the teenager who hid in a closet while a shooter rampaged outside the door but who is still capable of laughing until it hurts with friends are both saying, I have not been destroyed. I am still capable of joy. So as Vanessa and I understand it, joy is often closely associated with dissatisfaction with the way things are. And it often comes, we believe, from the creative work of imagining the way things might be. People feel joy as opposed to mere pleasure, the social critic Ivan Illich says, to the extent that their activities are creative. So we want to talk today about creativity and imagination in the life of faith, believing that these are capacities that have the potential to generate a deep and sustaining joy for adolescents and for all of us. The novelist Virginia Woolf once wrote that the whole world is a work of art. The author of the opening of the book of Genesis seems to have believed that too. God is the artist in this gorgeous hymn to creation, speaking the world into being, defining the edges of earth and sky, creating a home for life in all its forms. Because the first chapter of Genesis has been so thoroughly co-opted into cultural debates about science and religion though, it's easy to forget that it was not written as an argument against Darwin's theory of evolution. This account of creation was written during a particular historical moment, most likely the Babylonian exile. It was composed by an artist during a time of hopelessness and despair for a people who had been conquered and exiled. So what might the exiled people of Israel have heard in the verses of Genesis 1? Perhaps they would have heard that things can be otherwise. Perhaps they would have heard that change is possible, that something wholly new can happen. Chaos can be transformed into a habitable work of art, beloved by God, proclaimed good. As the scholar Walter Brueggemann has noted, the God of the first chapter of Genesis does not say there must be light, but rather let there be light. God does not decree creation 
like an authoritarian ruler signing executive orders. God sets unpredictable, creative possibility loose in the world. Let there be light. Let there be fish in the sea. Let us make human beings in our own image. This, of course, is one of the most arresting sentences in Genesis' litany of creation for anyone who hears it, for the people of Israel in exile, for us in 21st century America. God made human beings in God's own image, even in exile, even in sorrow. There is something about us that mirrors God back to God. So what is that something that marks our creation in God's image? It's more than we can know or explain, to be sure. But if we are made in the image of the God who made the world, then maybe one answer can be found in the creative impulse that is so much a part of our humanity. To be made in God's image is to have within us the capacity for creativity. And so when we are making something, whether it's a poem or a service of worship or a meal or a movement for justice, we participate in God's own creativity. If human creativity is a mark of God's image, then it is surely found at the heart of the life of faith. So often when religion is discussed in our culture, it's portrayed solely as a set of beliefs that we accept or reject, rather than imaginative, creative work. But what is any faith but something assembled from disparate elements, from scriptures, images, relationships, experiences, into something that is saturated with meaning? In the Gospels, Jesus shows us how this works by inviting us to exercise our religious imagination. He does this as he does so much of his teaching by telling stories and painting with words. The kingdom of heaven, he says, is like a mustard seed that starts out small and grows into a tree so large that the birds build its nest in its branches. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman stirs into flour so that she can make bread. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field or like a single perfect pearl hidden in plain sight among other pearls. The kingdom of heaven is like a net that brings up from the sea every kind of fish. There's a lot to learn from these parables. We learn that the kingdom of heaven does its secret work in hidden places, that it can be found in the ordinary stuff of life, that once it is added, it cannot be subtracted, that it begins as something so small we can barely see it and grows large enough to be lived in or transforms into something nourishing enough to sustain our lives. But we learn at least one more thing from the stories Jesus tells. We learn that there is no one correct answer to the question of what the kingdom of heaven is like. The question has multiple answers and maybe even infinite ones. By offering us a few of his, Jesus opens a space within which we might create our own stories, our own parables. He invites us to look around to see where the seeds of the kingdom of heaven might be waiting. Maybe the kingdom of heaven is like a book that a young person comes across by accident in the library and whose life is changed by what she reads in it. Maybe the kingdom of heaven is like a film whose vision of what the world might be is so powerful that it inspires the kids who see it to start working on their own worlds. Maybe the kingdom of heaven is like a shared meal that dissolves for a moment the distances between us. Maybe the kingdom of heaven is like a single act of resistance to cruelty that grows into a movement for change. Maybe the kingdom of heaven is like a hymn sung by a conquered people far from home about a God who delights in creating something new 
a hymn about the creativity of God from which they draw hope. Believing is often lifted up as the main way we express our faith, but imagining is just as important as believing. Indeed, believing depends upon our ability to imagine, to imagine a God we cannot see or feel the claim on us in this time and place of words which are ancient and sometimes difficult to understand. With his parables, Jesus reminds us that imagination is an irreplaceable dimension of the life of faith, a practice of the freedom of the glory of the children of God. His parables don't offer a definition of God's kingdom. They don't answer the question of what the kingdom of heaven is. They answer the question of what the kingdom of heaven is like. A seed, a pearl, a net, yeast, a hidden treasure. In his cascade of images, Jesus is teaching us to cultivate what the theologian David Tracy once called an analogical imagination. He invites us to think with things we can see and touch about things we can only imagine. If imagination is at the heart of the theological work of faith, it is also at the heart of the ethical choices to which Jesus calls us. During the last brutal months of the First World War, Virginia Woolf wrote in her diary that the willingness to kill must be a failure of the imagination, an inability to imagine another person's life and what it might become. The imaginative work at the heart of the life of faith challenges us to cultivate our capacity to imagine lives other than our own and to care about them enough to take them into account as we make choices about how we are going to live. If we can't imagine what the lives of others are like, if we can't feel reverence for the worlds they contain within them, if all we can do is project our fears and desires onto them, then we become dangerous to them. To lack imagination is to lack mercy the young survivors of gun violence we heard from a few weeks ago know this. In the Gospel of Matthew, after Jesus has told his parables about what the kingdom is, of heaven is like, he offers his followers a last teaching for the day. Every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven, he says, is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. This is how Jesus himself created. He took what was new, the ordinary experiences of the people around him, and what is old, the ancient wisdom that he inherited and reinterpreted, and he made something out of that combination that awakened the creativity and imagination of his hearers and continues to awaken ours. This is the practice that we want to commend to you today to take what is new and urgent in your young people's lives and use the wisdom of ancient practices to help them take what they already love and go deeper together in community. Now, our young people are already engaged in spiritual practices of imagination and creativity, but it's rare that our culture tells them that. What our culture tells them is not that they are creators, but that they are consumers. But young people who are seeing the film Black Panther multiple times or watching Beyonce's Lemonade and listening to the album over and over or who are on their fourth or fifth reading of the Harry Potter books or A Wrinkle in Time are not just consuming. They are thinking. They are wondering. And through their love and devotion to these films and songs and books and videos, they are engaged in a spiritual practice. One of the things we can do as teachers and youth leaders and mentors is to help our young people recognize and have confidence in the spiritual practices that they are already doing. 
As Sarah mentioned, Vanessa is the host of the podcast Harry Potter and the Sacred Text, and she and her co-host discuss a chapter of one of the Harry Potter books. They're working their way through all seven books, one chapter at a time, in the light of a theme like friendship or betrayal or privilege or faith. They choose, then they choose a portion of the text to read closely using an ancient spiritual reading practice, and then they offer a blessing to one of the characters. This podcast has a faithful, enthusiastic audience of mostly young listeners, although I listen and I'm not young, um, and I met some other older folks who like to listen. Um, most of their listeners, though, grew up with the Harry Potter books, so they're mostly millennials, 20-somethings, 30-somethings. But they also have many younger listeners in middle school and high school. Sometimes the kids are introduced to the podcast through their English teachers who want them to hear what it sounds like when two thoughtful people bring real questions to a book and then talk about them together. But most of the time, young people just find it on iTunes as they look for podcasts related to their great love, Harry Potter. And as of today, Harry Potter and the Sacred Text has been downloaded more than seven million times, mostly by young people. One of the things that I think has surprised Vanessa and the others who work on the show is how active and engaged their listeners are. They are constantly receiving email and voicemail from listeners who sometimes write just to say thank you, sometimes to disagree, often vehemently, with something Vanessa or Casper has said about the chapter under discussion, and sometimes to offer their own ideas about the text. Sometimes they tell Vanessa and Casper very difficult truths about their lives. I was abused as a child, some write, and reading about Harry Potter navigating his own childhood abuse helped me survive. I was abused as a child, some write, and it hurts me when you talk about forgiveness. I was abused as a child, and so the Harry Potter books were sacred to me long before I found your podcast. Responding pastorally to this far-flung community has been one of the unexpected challenges of Vanessa's work, and I'm sure she'd be glad to answer questions about that during our Q&A. But I wanted to read to you from an email the podcast received recently from a teenager in the 10th grade. The subject line read, from a high schooler. Dear Casper, Vanessa, Ariana, and everyone who contributes to Harry Potter and the Sacred Text, my name is Sophie, and I love, capital L-O-V-E, your podcast. She writes about stumbling onto the podcast on the internet, listening to the first episode, getting completely hooked. She goes on to say that she had recently read all the Harry Potter books and had fallen in love with them. I would read them whenever I could, she wrote, and on weekends, I barely did anything else. By the end of December, I finished the series, and I was so in love with the story and the whole wizarding world, I cried a few times after I was finished. I was so desperate for something to keep the momentum going, because the feeling of having nothing else was so overwhelming. Now, I expect this overwhelming devotion to something she loves sounds familiar to you from the lives of the kids with whom you minister. Maybe it's not Harry Potter that gets them this excited, but there's something out there that they love and can't get enough of, right? This girl, Sophie, writes that she was so glad to find the podcast that it's making her see things differently than when she read it the first time. She says she's listening to one episode a night, trying to catch up, reading the chapter and taking notes on the theme Vanessa and Casper have chosen. And at the end of the letter, she writes something that really struck me. She said, what I hate more than anything else is waking up in the morning. But now I'm happy to wake up because I know it means that I get to listen to an episode and take notes on the bus about what you both have to say. This is the kind of joy that we hope our young people will experience. It's the kind of joy I hope we will experience to have something that makes us excited to get up in the morning or keeps us up late at night, to love something so much that it calls to us while we're still in our beds, hating to get up because we're tired or because we're depressed or because we're overwhelmed with the demands of our lives. I slept, but my heart was awake. 
one of the lovers, in the Song of Songs says about the way her love for her beloved keeps her always listening for his voice. Joy keeps our hearts awake, even when we're sleeping. That is the kind of joy that gives meaning to our days and has the power to shape our lives. Now sometimes kids are criticized for this kind of joy. Sometimes they're told that they love what they love a little too much and could they please stop talking constantly about Harry Potter or Black Panther or Beyonce. And as the mother of a child who is constantly falling in love with books and films and music videos, I may have tamped down a little joy myself from time to time. Sometimes kids are criticized for their reading or viewing or listening because the adults around them consider their books and movies and music escapist, and we'd rather kids focus on something more serious. But as the great science fiction writer Ursula Le Guin once wondered, why do we criticize people for wanting to escape? Nobody escapes to jail, she said. The direction of escape is towards freedom. The writer Annie Dillard describes in her autobiography what she was looking for in books when she was young. I was looking for imagination, she says. I was looking for depth of thought and feeling. I myself was getting wild. I wanted wildness, originality, genius, rapture, hope. Those of us who read carried around with us like martyrs a secret knowledge, a secret joy, a secret hope that there's a life worth living which could be found and joined like the resistance. I kept this exhilarating faith alive in myself, she wrote, through reading. Our kids are often carrying around that kind of exhilarating faith in the possibilities of their life that is awakened in them by what they read or watch or listen to. What if their church said to them, you know that feeling you have when you're watching Wakanda unfold on the screen or when you're reading about Harry Potter, finding out that he's not a forgotten orphan but a longed-for wizard, or when you're watching Beyonce knit poetry and music and dance into something completely new? What if we said to them, that feeling is a reflection of your creation in the image of God? And church is a place to explore in community the things that make you feel creative and alive. It's a place to find ways of responding with your own stories, your own poetry, your own music and images, your own lives. What if we said the books and films and music that are lighting up your imagination are sacred because they connect you to the most sacred parts of yourself? your creativity, your imagination, your reflection of God's image. And sacred texts are so full of meaning that they spill over and invite you to exercise your own creativity the way Jesus invited those around him and invites us still to hear his parables and to compose our own out of the stuff of our own lives. Now, you may be thinking, what's all this about sacred texts? We've got one sacred text, and it's the Bible. One of the founding slogans of my own denomination, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, any disciples in the room? All right. Is no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible. Yep. So what do we mean when we say we are reading Harry Potter as if it were a sacred text? We mean, first of all, that sacred texts are worthy of being read closely, prayerfully, contemplatively in community. They stand up well to careful scrutiny. They are rich in meaning that keeps unfolding. We mean that sacred texts are generative, that they are themselves creative, that they create more texts, more commentary, more hymns and prayers, more music, more books and films, more and more ideas about how to live. We mean that sacred texts are made sacred by a community that thinks with them, prays with them, hopes with them, finds joy in them. But I think we won't always be able to recognize them ourselves. We'll need our young people to guide us, to show us which books, which films, which music are full of meaning, which ones can lead them deeper and deeper into their most urgent questions and their fiercest hopes. What time is it? You're fine. Emma, what time is it? Um, 1.06. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up then. Um, so how do we do this? 
How do we help our kids engage in the sacred text that they are already reading and watching and listening to? How do we help them recognize what they are doing as a spiritual practice? There are any number of ways, and I hope we'll have time to imagine some of them together. Sarah told us last night that her church rented out two whole theaters so that everybody could go see Black Panther together to experience it as a community. And I expect that there were many intergenerational conversations afterwards that got to a very deep place. That shared viewing and talking in community, that's a spiritual practice. I was going to give some examples, but I want you to experience the example of Vanessa leading us in Lexio Divina, so I am going to skip over that and just say that in Virginia Woolf's novel, To the Lighthouse, My Sacred Text, a painter named Lily Briscoe at the end of the novel is reflecting on the meaning of life. She's been thinking about it all through the novel, and we get to the end and she thinks the great revelation hasn't come. But she th does think in addition, instead of the great revelation, there were little daily miracles, illuminations, matches struck unexpectedly in the dark. Moments when we tap into the creativity and imagination that is our inheritance as children of God are like that. Matches struck in the dark that light the way forward on our journey. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, if you have to go, go get more food. Um, my name is Vanessa, and you should all have um, access to one of these sheets of paper on your tables. And they are, um, it's a Lexio Divina worksheet that actually one of our listeners created. And if you are interested in more spiritual practice worksheets, our listeners have created a lot, and they're all on our website. So you can print these out. So I thought what would be fun, first let me ask, how many people here have never read the Harry Potter books or never seen a Harry Potter movie? There's no shame here. Okay. Thank you for your honesty. So what we're going to do, we are going to do Lexio Divina with the opening line of the Harry Potter books. Because that way, nobody can say, I don't know what's happening here. I can't help with this process. We're going to do this all together. Now, here's a question. How many of you know the first line of the Harry Potter books by heart? I mean... Really? Okay. This is the lowest, or some of you are just ashamed to admit it. That's fine too. So the opening line, we are going to do um, this opening line, and if you would like to write it in the first, you know, in the top box, that's fine. It's a sort of long sentence. I will keep reciting it so you don't need to. But the first line is, would you, would you like to do it, Cassie? Yes, Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet Drive. We're proud to say they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. A plus job, you did it. Um, so Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet Drive, we're proud to say they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. So one of the joys of Lexio Divina is that we start very textual and that we will end with, with it, the text being in conversation with ourselves. But first we have to orient ourselves. So let's, we're, we don't have to orient ourselves in the text because it's the very first sentence. But what does this sentence literally mean? Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet Drive, were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. Who wants to tell me what is going on in this sentence? Yes. Right, they do not want to stand out in any way. They want to live in a certain way. They want to be normal, right? Yes, great, yes. They are defined by where they live. Yes, they are very British, right? Number four, Privet Drive. And they, um, they live in Surrey, in a suburb. They are living a very particular kind of life. Number four, Privet Drive. We know it's a house, right? We don't have an apartment unit. What else is literally happening in the sentence? Yes. They're validating themselves by their normality. Yes, they are validating themselves by their normality. And we also get, I mean, it's Mr. and Mrs. Dursley, right? So we know they're a heteronormative couple um, who like going by their last names. It's not Vernon and Petunia, right? We're introduced to them in this very formal way. 
Yes. Yes, there is a combativeness to the thank you very much. The thank you very much is brilliant, right? This is a series called the Harry Potter series, and we do not start with Harry Potter. We start with Mr. and Mrs. Dursley. And I think that it's, it, it's to orient us into the, the boringness of this muggle, non-wizarding world that Harry is in. And we get at the very first sentence how defensive and combative the couple who raises Harry is, the abusive home and environment that he was raised in. I think we're good, yeah? Anybody else with a burning? You all are like, no, please stop asking us to get involved. Okay, <laughs> great. Then step two is allegory. So what words jump out at us that signify other things in other stories of our lives? So for example, privet, right? A privet is, oh, you, you wanted to say something about privet? You're just nodding. If you like fix your hair, I'm gonna call on you. I'm like, oh, you moved your arm. <laughs> so don't, don't move if you don't want me to call on you. Um, privet, right, is a hedge. And so privet also to me sounds like private, right? It's people who want to stay boxed in, right? What else? Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four Privet Drive were proud to say they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. Yes. Four is a very round number. Yes, four is a very round, boring kind of number. Chairs have four legs, right? It is like very stable. It is not three um, or a more interesting number. They don't live at 666 Privet Drive, although maybe they should. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> to dislike them, right, to laugh at them. So she was saying that the name Dursley itself is like this, right, like it sounds like drudgery. It's not a name that like lights up. They're not the, I mean, later in the books we meet Luna Lovegood, right? This is not a name like Lovegood. Were you raising your hand or you, yes. Oh, hold on, someone behind you and then I'll come to you. Yes. I'm sorry? Yes, it's in third person. We find out right at the beginning that we are gonna be hearing a story about other people. It's not like, hi, my name is Harry Potter and here is my memoir, right? It could start in a very different way. Yes. Yes, the word normal, do you wanna say more about that? Right. I mean, the belief with the word normal, what, we, what I take from it in this context is that society has come to a conclusion as to what we should behave like, and we, the Dursleys, are going to try to live up to that because that is the standard to which we hold ourselves. These are not people who are, um, it's, they were proud to say that they were, they were charitable. They were proud to say that they were good. They, were pr they are proud to say that they are normal. Yes, you're right here. Right, perfectly normal. It's, um, methinks thou do protest too much, right? If you are perfectly normal, something is amiss. And we're gonna have a last comment here, yes. Oh, just the whole, like, thank you very much, just kind of reminds me of, in The Hobbit, when it's like, dismissive way of saying goodbye or the case flows, like, good day, you know? Right. Like, thank you very much, Clay. And British manners. Yeah, like when someone says, bless your heart, what they mean is, I judge you, <laughs> right, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you very much means no thank you. Like, we are done having this conversation. Excellent. So next, okay, we have six minutes. So the next step, what we call stage three, what we ask ourselves, because we on the podcast use these sacred practices, but we try to use more inclusive language. So if we were doing a traditional Christian Lexio Divina, we would say, what is the text calling for me? What is the text speaking to me? And what we say instead is, what does this remind me of in my own life? Where, and, and this is where we actually got into a lot of trouble. In the very first chapter of, um, very first episode of the podcast, we were asking people to see themselves in the Dursleys. And so we did, we heard from a lot of victims of abuse saying, I have no interest in seeing myself in the Dursleys and please do not help people empathize with them. And that was something we took very seriously and have, and has certainly pushed my feelings and thoughts on who is important for us to empathize with and who is not. But I do think it is important for us to see the potential villains within ourselves, right? The Dursley-ishness within ourselves, which is what I think step three with this sentence can do. It's not about us saying, yes, Dursleys, I totally validate your experience. It's saying, oh, there's some of that in me. 
and I want to make sure, I want to aspire to something different than that. So what does, we can just hear from one person about this sentence, Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four Privet Drive were proud to say they were perfectly normal, thank you very much. What does that, yes, in the back. Uh huh. Don't look here. Yeah. Right? So she was saying that there have been times in her life where she has wanted to just completely fit in. Right? And I think, especially in work with adolescents, that is something that I, I know that middle school me would have done anything to just look like whatever wall I was standing next to. Right? To, I, and I think that we all have some of that, right? We all want, we all have the desire to be normal on at least one level, right? Or even if we have the desire to stand out, it is in contrast to what is normal. Um, wonderful. And then step four of Lectio Divina, what we ask ourselves is what has this, not only this sentence, but this process of doing Lectio Divina together. And this is an exciting thing, I think, when we are gathered together to do it. So if you have a group of teenagers doing Lectio Divina with Black Panther together, with Harry Potter, with Lemonade, um, it's what have we learned together and what has this conversation called us to? So what is an action item that you would like to take? And what we try to do in the class is say, in the next week, what is something actionable that this conversation has led you to want to do? Does anybody want to share something? Usually we take a moment of reflection. We're doing, you know, speed New York version of this. Yes, Peter. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm answering the question correctly, but... You're probably not answering the question correctly. You're wrong and bad. <laughs> but number four, there's, there's a number two, perhaps a number three. Uh-huh. Who are the neighbors? What are they? Yes, like? okay. What, what's their neighborhood? What, are these all normal people? Right, so Peter was... Oh, so, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Peter was wondering who lives at number one, two, and three, right? He has neighbors. And so maybe an action item is, I am going to talk to my neighbor more. I am somebody who walks around with headphones all of the time, and it is often to avoid talking to my neighbor. So I'm going to use your call, Peter. I'm going over the next week to not have my headphones on when I leave my apartment until I get let's say 20 yards away, so it's actionable. I love low standards so that I can clear those bars. So these are the kinds of things that we do and that we really believe can move people to take small actions to try to be the kind of person that they would imagine themselves to want to be. You want to be Harry Potter, not Draco Malfoy, right? Um, you want to be that child dancing in front of the police officers. We want to be these people. And Lexio Divina is one of the ways that we can really imagine ourselves into it. So I'm going to make sure that we end on time. And Happy to answer questions after the Q&A. Thank you. All right, I hope you have reloaded with seconds on the food, with some of those wonderful chocolate chip or cranberry cookies. I mean, cranberry is a little healthy for me, but the chocolate chips and the brownies and the coffee. We're going to turn to question and answer, but I want to ask your help in this regard. We have our YouTube live audience, and they hear what's over this mic or this mic, but they can't hear you at your chair. So if you have a question, would you give me a chance to bring you the microphone, or if you prefer, come to the podium uh, to pose your, your question for Professor Pozel and, and Vanessa Zoltan. Who has a question today? There's one over there. Yes, ma'am. God bless you all. I have a question, um, and it's because I hear in my community um, a lot about Harry Potter. And mentioning Harry Potter and bringing this into a youth conversation, it really like, I don't know how to take this. So I was wondering, why is it that we are using these books to talk about or to start the conversation? Um, and if that's appropriate for our Christian youth that does not have a foundation in their faith. 
Thank you. That's a very good question. Do you mean because it deals with magic and that kind of thing. Um, well, I would say a couple of things about that. One is we are interested in starting with things that our young people love because we think that whatever they're bringing their devotion to, they're learning about spiritual practice from that. Um, they're reading and rereading and asking questions and talking to each other about it. And th in a way, they're already involved in the kind of spiritual practice that, that churches are always involved in around the Bible. Um, Harry J.K. Rowling also, the author of Harry Potter, I don't know if she owns up to this, but there are a lot of Christian themes in that book. Um, and sometimes Vanessa and Casper on their podcast will bring out those themes, although not everyone who listens is a Christian. Um, but there, it's a story about someone giving his life for his friends. And and so there are certainly more explicitly Christian ways to engage the story. Um, and I think, um, you know, when I said we won't always know what the sacred texts are, you know, we'll look and say, mm, that's a story about wizards and witches. And I'm not sure that's the appropriate choice. I think what we need to do is ask the kids, what is it about that story that is capturing you? What is it that makes you read that book over and over again? What are you looking for? Um, and to help them find church as a place where they can bring that, rather than saying, that's not appropriate for a Christian space to say, bring what you love and let's look at it together and let me learn from you and let's go deeper. And what does the word private or privet remind you of? And what does the word normal remind you of? You know, just that sort of close, careful reading that knits us together. I mean, you can see, you know, I didn't leave Vanessa enough time, but you can see in that tiny little amount of time she had, all that came out, all the wisdom that came out of this group and how for a minute, we're knit together. We're, we're readers together. We're, we're gathered around this text. Um, that's what we do in church. We read scripture and we think, mm, what do these words remind me of? And what does this mean for my life? The, the part I cut out of my talk was to explain the practices a little bit. And I, I do want to say one word about Lexio Divina, which is the practice that, that Vanessa um, led us in. Lexio Divina was a practice that you know, came out of Jewish practices like Pardes that, that also read scripture very closely. And um, some, some medieval people thought about Lexio Divina as a ladder that stretched up to heaven to God and that you could step on the first rung through reading scripture. And then the second rung was meditation where you, you know, you did what we did here in this room. And then if you meditate on scripture, you'll naturally be led to prayer, which is the third rung. And that might lead you, all, you know, to God. That might lead you to an experience of the presence of God. Other people understood it like a ladder that you would put down into a well. And you would just go deeper and deeper and deeper. And that's really what Vanessa was doing with us. So that the top rung of your ladder that's sticking out of the well is reading. And you read your passage and then you ask, what is this, what, what do the words in this passage point to? What's the literal meaning? Then what are the words, what might be an underlying meaning of some of these words? And then in, in the Christian practice of Lexio Divina, the next one is the moral meaning. What does this have to do with how, you know, I read the story from the Gospels and I think, what, is this, what does this have to do with how I live my life? What's my action item, as Vanessa put it? for my life from reading this. And then the, the deepest rung was the mystical rung, which is, you know, you read so deeply that you, 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 you learn something about God. And um, I was going to say in my talk that we couldn't promise any mystical experiences today, <laughs> but, that, but that you can get pretty deep pretty fast, as, as I think we saw. So it's a great question, and I think a lot of people will have that question in our communities, and we need to be prepared to answer it. Um, I think the main thing is that we want to start with what our young people already love and what they're already in their way praying over. Do you have anything you want to say? Thank you. Questions? 
Um, first, I just want to say thank you for what you shared. I felt like my mind was like firing off all these new ideas. I'm a, a director of children and youth ministry at a church, so like thank you for what you shared. Um, I have two questions. One is like you've talked a lot about like Black Panther and Beyonce and like you know Lexio Divina is built upon reading and all those are viewing. And so I, one question was, do you engage those differently? Um, and the second question was, you know, how do you transform people from readers or consumers or viewers into like living lives of joy and being more active in that? So yeah. So um, I led, a, well, facilitated um, a, a session on lemonade. And what we did, I'll just say, is we printed some of the words and then we did a still, we watched the song and then we did a still frame of it. And, you know, for, and we did Lexio Divina with it. And what was literally going on in the image, right? Allegorically, she, you know, in the scene that we watched, she's wearing this big yellow dress. And it's like, why is she wearing this big yellow dress? What is the meaning of that? And I was doing it with mostly young people. And what was incredible was how many stories they had for step three about what their fashion choices mean to them and why they dress and the way that they dress. And it ended up being an incredibly fruitful conversation. So I, and, that is an example to say, I'm, I certainly haven't figured out the right way. And on, on the podcast, we use five different spiritual practices. And I, I, there isn't a right way to do any of them, right? Um, and I think we should be invited to be creative with them and to meet people where they are. But um, I think that there's sort of limit, you know, limitless opportunities to be creative with these things. Um, and then I wanted to say something about your second question too. Remind me. Oh yeah. So this is something that Stephanie talks about a lot. And that um, what I really think is that we are inviting people to practice being the person who they want to be and thinking through the person who they want to be, so that when they are in a tough situation, they will have already thought about it. And so the example that I learned from Stephanie and that I talk about all the time now is um, a town, a Huguenot town in France who had um, hundreds of years of history of being persecuted and had dedicated their lives to radical hospitality. And then um, World War II rolls around and Jews start knocking on their doors and they didn't have to think about it. They're just used to opening doors and inviting people in and they ended up sending, uh, saving thousands of Jews. And you know, sometimes you'll go generations without being necessarily called for the thing that you've trained your whole, you know, life for, or your whole culture for. But I think in, even when Jews aren't knocking, this is a town of hospitality, right? And so if you think to yourself, um, I want to be a, a kind and patient person, practicing that through a text constantly. And if you say, the action item that I want to be called to is patience. Okay, well, I hate Draco Malfoy. How do I practice being patient with Draco? And if you practice being patient with Draco, maybe you'll be more patient with your upstairs neighbor who does not understand that when they walk around at five in the morning, it sounds like a basketball is going and is driving you crazy, right? And so I think it's important to practice when the stakes are low because the stakes are much higher in real life, right? And so if we can practice in these fictional characters, I think it can transfer to real life. Thank you. You, uh, I think this ties um, to uh, a degree to what you were just saying, but you said the phrase, and I wrote it down, uh, be the sort of person you imagine yourself to want to be, which that seemed intentional, and I was, I could be wrong, but uh, if that was indeed intentional, would you impact, or would you, would you unpack kind of why you, why you chose that phrase and what that phrase means to you of uh, who people imagine themselves to want to be? Yes. Um, I think that Often what, um, what culture has taught us to want is um, money and fame or glory. But when we imagine who we want to be, we want to be good. Um, right? I, I, I have very crass desires. I want a big house and comfort and all sorts of things. But if I imagine myself as Jane Eyre, I want to be principled and honest and good. 
um, and think by contemplating on Jane Eyre, I can sort of put those two different desires in conversation with each other. I don't, I don't think our wants, our desires are necessarily always noble, but if we take, if we take it a step further and think, who do, I, who do I want to want to be, right? I think is maybe another way to say it. Who do I want to want to be? So does that, that make sense? Um, a question for, for Vanessa. You mentioned Jane Eyre, and Jane Eyre has sort of played second fiddle today. Um, I, I'm kind of curious. <laughs> the, um, when you mentioned Jane Eyre, right away I started thinking of uh, another book of hers, Villette. And I sometimes read Villette as Jane Eyre grown up. Do listeners to the podcast speak about progressions? Um, like going from Harry Potter, let's say, to something else. I mean, I was speaking with Kathy about um, my reading Lord of the Rings. And that, for me, is sort of a go-to book when life seems to be a bit spinning out of control. Um, students, young people who have followed the po podcast for a while, do they talk about this sort of progression or a vision for where they would like, n not so much what they would like to be as people, but what they would like to see their world as? Well, there have been amazing articles that have come out um, in the last few weeks about um, the, um, all of the March for Our Lives protests, how many Harry Potter images um, there were. And I mean, my favorite sign from the Women's March last year was in a, um, in a world full of Vol Voldemorts, we're gonna need a lot of Hermione's. Um, and we hear from people who have what would Hermione do bracelets. Um, and so, I mean, people, people are absolutely doing that. And the other thing that's amazing about the Harry Potter world, the questions have come from this side, so I've been looking here. Hello. Um, that one of the amazing things about the Harry Potter universe is how much fan fiction there is. And so the Harry Potter world has been a place where young people can imagine queer relationships, um, interracial relationships. They can reimagine a character. I mean, we just saw Cursed Child, which is coming to Broadway. Hermione is black. And J.K. Rowling is like, yep, I think there should be a black Hermione, right? So Harry Potter is such a generative text that it has really grown and people have been deeply creative with it. Um, and I do think, I mean, the thing that we hear from people is Harry Potter turned me into a reader. Um, so that, that is a lot of people's experiences. I don't have a question, I just have a comment. Something that just keeps running through my mind um, and it kind of speaks to the question that came from over here about uh, these different forms of media that kids might connect with is I kind of feel like it's my job in my ministry at my church to help children and youth make the everyday more sacred and the sacred more everyday, kind of marry those two things. So um, that thought just keeps sort of running through my head as this conversation continues. I appreciate that. I think that's the parables, you know. I think Jesus took the everyday, making bread, trees growing out of the ground, um, fishermen putting their nets in the ocean. I, th I think he, he taught us to look at just the stuff of our lives and see the sacred within it. Um, how many young people do you have on this podcast? You said the number, but I forgot. So we have about 50,000 listeners every week. Um, okay. Yeah. So that's 50,000 young minds that are open out there. That is a tremendous thing that you're doing. Oh, thank you. And if someone has an objection to the Harry Potter books, books they could use your whole platform to take something else that they can find in their own churches that, pe that young people relate to and build the same format, Absolutely. and then they'd all be happy. Yeah. Yes, I including the Bible. Right, right, <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah. We, we hear from people who um, are starting their own groups 
Um, we have some resources on our website for how to start. This started as a class in Cambridge. We had 30 people coming every week. And, right. um, and so we have people who are doing this with um, To Kill a Mockingbird. We have a group in, um, who wrote to us in Tacoma, Washington, who's doing it with Infinite Jest. That sounds terrible to me, but they're having a great time. I'm like, you guys are going to be together for 30 years. Um, but so people are doing this with what you know with texts that mean something to them. That's wonderful. But you know, it doesn't just have to be books, right? No, somebody it is doing it with Moana. Any mechanism you can think of, yeah, to yeah. use. The example you know? I like to give is my little brother does this with baseball. Oh, um, wow. You know, he. I feel like he more than anyone taught me how to treat something as sacred. He sees endless meaning in baseball and thinks of his life in terms of metaphors of baseball. And it has been so helpful to him to see, right? It's in baseball, if you bat 300, so if you only hit the ball 30% of the time, you're amazing, right? You are a great hitter. And that is a metaphor that means a lot to my brother. He's like, if I succeed 30% of the time, I'm winning. And, um, so yeah, I think that we can see this in anything. Well, I think what you've done is incredible. I, I'm the curriculum writer at my church for this fifth grade class called Bible 101. And I did one lesson in which I had the students interpret, I think it was the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, but going back and forth listening to an episode of the podcast so they could learn how to do Lexio Divina was something that they understood very well, Harry Potter, and then turn to the Bible and say, okay, how would we do this with the Bible? I think it, it worked, you know, Vanessa's done it by learning, you know, the practice in relation to the Bible and then going toward Harry Potter, but it works very well the other way as well. Hi, I just want to say thank you. I've been listening to the podcast for the past couple months and have been very slowly working my way through. Um, and something I've kind of been wondering as I've been listening, but also as you've been talking today, um, is how do you engage with kind of the question of authorship? Um, like I think about the Bible and there's some level of this is something that the source is divine. And I know thinking about Harry Potter, like, like, I've had some struggles like dealing with like, how does this relate to like how I feel about JK Rowling because um, my relationship with kind of at least the idea of her is a lot more complicated than, you know, than just the books themselves. And so I'm just wondering how do you, how do you deal with that question when you've got like a person who has their own problems, who is the source of this thing? Yeah. Well, um, so how we deal with it on the podcast is that J.K. Rowling, who? Um, so we just sort of pretend there isn't an author, um, which, you know, is a literary theory, theoretical approach, right? Um, but, and the reason for that is that it creates more opportunities for creativity, actually. So there are mistakes in the books, right? There are plot holes in the books. But one of the most joyful things for me is, okay, well, what do we make, how do we make meaning of those plot holes? Um, and just like we would if we believe that it was a divine text. So, for example, in the first chapter of the book, um, Dumbledore apparates. He just appears on Privet Drive, and he does it silently. And then later in the books, we find out that apparition is very loud, and that there's a very loud crack. And then you could justify, well, Dumbledore's a great wizard, so he maybe knows how to do it silently. Except in book six, when they're going to pick up Slughorn, for those of you who know, we find out that Dumbledore operates very loudly. And so, you know, the first couple of times I read the book for fun, I was like, well, this is a plot hole. She obviously decided somewhere in book three the apparition was going to be loud and forgot that in chapter one she said it was silent. But then there's an opportunity to look deeper, right? Dumbledore's already injured, and he's operating with Harry in book six. So maybe when he's injured and dying, he can no longer muster the strength to operate silently. Or maybe when he has Harry with him and has to operate with somebody else, right? And what is the lesson there? That something is harder 
at, you know, in different stages of your life or if you're bringing someone with you, but all you're giving up is making a little more noise or all you're giving up is the grace, right? And so I think that by pretending there isn't J.K. Rowling, there, there are new opportunities in that. And I would say that, you know, the Bible, it, uh, divinely inspired, there are, there are problems with it that we have to wrestle with, right? Um, and so um, I think that the tactics can be quite similar. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, um, I mean, the Bible is full of gaps that we can either say, well, that's J and that's E and that's P and that's D and that's how that solves that problem. Or we can, we can say, I wonder, you know, we can just keep going with it the way medieval people did, the way Vanessa is doing on the podcast, that, you know, the way um, Midrash was created, you know, the rabbis got into the gaps of the text and they filled it up with a new story. Um, and, and that's something, I think that's such a similarity between what we're calling for, bless you, and, um, and what we, you know, we've learned to do with the Bible, what, what, what has been done with the Bible over centuries. Um, and the divine inspiration question, that's a good question. Um, you know, if, we're, if our creativity is a reflection of being made in the image of God, then what's not divinely inspired? Um, any, you know, any creation um, that's generative that you can enter into in this rich way, that you can learn to, to cultivate empathy and figure out how to be the person you want to be, um, who's not to say it's not divinely inspired? Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Would you join me in thanking our guest today, Dr. Stephanie Pozzell.